difficult to follow after the aesthetic Jasiri, uh, but my presentation is essentially uh, an elaboration or a complement to what uh, Hank as well as Jasiri highlighted, focusing primarily on this question of people centered ASEAN. Are going to be more inclusive? Are people uh, uh, centered in this integrating ASEAN? I'll focus on a few ones. The first one is, we had a survey of aspirations and expectations of people in the region. And one of the things that, the, one of the highest aspirations related to good governance, really low uh, uh, corruption, but take note the expectations is much, much lower than their expectations. Secondly, this que question of equitable access is of course linked to our inclusiveness. Again, they want a much more inclusive Russia. But again, expectation is much less. This is where the challenge is. Um, and if you look in terms of what they call depressing problems, like corruption was number one, and third is about income, is about inequity again. So we are actually right into the, the, the ma main concerns of uh, the average as a, uh, also essentially highlighting what we've been discussing so far, the whole thing about Trump Brexit is really about inclusive growth. Uh, secondly, um, this thing about digital revolution is the possibility that it can actually be used for inclusive growth, although there are, of course, risks involved in, in it. Uh, but also, please take note that we are really in the growth center of the world, and we have to make use of that. Which brings me to what could be a broad framework for engendering inclusiveness as well as social equity, and of course, a robust integration. Uh, well, essentially, you have two elements of this uh, social equity. One is poverty reduction, um, which of course means you've got to have high growth, which means of course you've got to have good, high investments. Uh, that's equally important because there are so many for uh, still, not just the question of inequity, but the sheer element of poverty. Of course, the other one is reduced, um, reduced inequality. Um, with, of course, the broad strategy, really, is one, how can you enhance many of those direct investment and growth drivers uh, as indirect equity enablers? You have to think of ways by which they can become equally supportive of equity, uh, social uh, reducing uh, inequality. Second, of course, is how can we strengthen direct equity dri uh, drivers which are themselves also indirect growth drivers. And the third one, based on this discussion, is how can you enhance digital innovations as means for inclusiveness and people-centeredness? By the way, if there is a table, of course, in Job's presentation, the last one is what's most fascinating, it's not even discussed. Vietnam, as one, of course, has one of the highest growth rates, uh, after China has one of the most successful reduction in poverty incidents in the world, and yet if you look at it, the same Gini coefficient. This is a high growth with equity. We should understand how that happened. We have not even discussed it, but that's actually what we need to focus on. Uh, anyway, uh, given a limited, how much more time do I have? Uh, <laughs> I look at some of those measures. Um, definitely seamless trade facilitation is actually important. Of course, for integration, for competitiveness, but actually much of that is not for Toyotas. It is for small enterprises. Think of that mindset. In fact, e-commerce, to be really useful for, for SMEs, requires really seamless trade facilitation. Uh, so that's what we need to think of. Um, how you can make those supportive of SMEs, NTMs. This question of transparency is so important. We know everything, the tariffs is gone. Well, I was shocked by the numbers that uh, uh, Jose Rizal highlighted about, and this is quantitative restrictions. That means lack of transparency in the region is actually a critical element, and that's why the focus right now of really dealing with this question of transparency is very important 
to make and to ensure that indeed the uh, AEC works well. But there are also other elements of it, and it is, uh, we know strategy conform is a very important element with respect to oh, five minutes uh, in, in dealing with the NTMs. And that means laboratories. It means um, that's what you need for SMEs. They, they, they don't need to send uh, their, the products for, for testing abroad. And of course, about uh, regulations to be about narrowed as much as possible. Connectivity was highlighted, of course, by the city. And in some respects, this, this collective development, I thought, was fantastic uh, as, as an idea. It's an, this is essentially where the BRI is. It's an important complement to all of this. But services also is actually important um, because a lot of the new uh, in businesses are related to uh, services. And you need to import as much as export to become competitive in, in the service industry. Uh, that's what I'm sensing, putting there. Of course, all of that has been bought not only in terms of, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, anti-competition, uh, anti-corruption, but also in terms of uh, centeredness because GRP, which by the way, these are all what are right now in the AEC blueprint 2025. Uh, that actually, in principle, gives greater people-centeredness, gives voice to people, and it's hopefully with SMEs. Um, the more you have greater cooperation uh, in terms of regulatory, regulatory distance, the better for, for MSMEs, because complex regulations uh, are more burdensome to SMEs than for large enterprises. So all of these are actually for SMEs. It's all a question of implementation, it's all a question of mindset. Uh, and really, digital innovation. I thought the uh, ASEAN uh, uh, in, uh, invest, Trade and Investment uh, Summit, uh, uh, Business Investment Summit uh, two years ago, was, was really very good. They focused a lot on digital innovations. Um, but again, uh, that calls for free data flows, efficient logistics, payment systems. Um, and it is interesting, some of these are actually innovations in the region, such as like mm -hmm. Lendo, for example. Uh, but equally important is that you can have a more effective target of subsidies because of it. You get more efficient delivery of government services, and definitely, again, get a voice uh, from various stakeholders. So digital innovation, if it's done well, could actually be the way by which you could really have much more inclusive growth. Well, that's all. Of course, there are problems, there are risks, and that's what it calls analog components that the World Bank highlighted. That is, uh, you've got to have the good regulatory regime uh, uh, with respect to it. Um, otherwise, you'll also have this hollowing out of the market that they, they're sort of highlighted. Clearly, um, apart from all of those, you also have to invest on education, on health, electricity, irrigation, farm to market roads, social safety net, so many of these things. I'm putting again Vietnam indicators because it really shows that, uh, I, of course I compared here, unfortunately very good, uh, China and uh, Vietnam. And you can see really the, the case for, for Vietnam. We know very high growth rates and equally very stable, equitable growth. I think it is linked to the fact that access to people, in terms of infrastructure, even if electricity, is almost 100%. But also, equally important, is greater understanding of linking to comparative advantage. The problem for the Philippines is actually that, that uh, we didn't really make full use of what the essence of advantage is. We have very high minimum weights than the relative average weights. They don't have that. Our power cost is extremely high. You cannot have really a manufacturing sector uh, for it. Uh, I, I know that there's about all these hacenderos and, uh, and the like, but actually the fundamentals are that we did not follow the essence, the nuance of comparative advantage as well as having this sort of critical basic infrastructure, uh, such as 
for everybody.